Hello? And it may not project, but just, yeah. And I'm Carolyn Becker. I'm an endocrinologist here in Boston and see a lot of people with osteoporosis and bone disease. And I'm hoping to work with Dr. Castells and Dr. Aiken in terms of studying um, this population and learning more about this disorder and how we can treat it. Um, I've had bone density the last six years, and in the last two years, um, osteopenia has become a problem. And um, last year, my hip had thinned, so I focused on the weight bearing and you know taking the calcium. I tried Evista, but had bleeding problems, and um, so he took me off of that because I had not entered menopause, which is when we lose the most bone. So um, this year, my hip was better, but my spine was a lot worse. So what wouldn't, now I've entered in menopause. So would now the drug that you mentioned yesterday be something that I should really look at um, and for that protocol? Again, it's weird talking into something. <laughs> I, this this may not be doing anything, but um, I, I think of osteoporosis as three discrete phases. Now, that's not true, but I, I think it's helpful. One occurs in childhood and adolescence when we're forming our skeleton that we're going to have for the rest of our lives. That's a very important time. So in many ways, osteoporosis is a pediatric disease because if you don't build a good skeleton in your te childhood teens and 20s, you're going to be at much higher risk when you get older. So that's a critical time for any of you who have children. Um, they should drink milk. They should exercise. They shouldn't smoke, all of that good stuff. The second critical time is for women at the time of menopause. Um, so we build our skeletons during childhood, and then men and women maintain a bone density pretty stable until about age 50 or whenever menop menopause occurs. Men start to lose a little bit of bone after 35, but very, very, very slowly. And as far as I know, there's no menopause for men, but... Maybe we'll find that someday. There, there are other things that happen. But if, so you're in a critical, if you're entering menopause or in the early year or two after menopause, this is another major transition time when you can lose a lot of bone. The third time is when we're elderly and at higher risk for falls, frailty, um, and fractures and have more diseases and other things kick in. So I think of those three critical times as times to intervene and be very proactive. So you're at a critical time right now when, though your bone density may not be that low, you're at risk for losing bone and you've got a disorder that might enhance that. So you, you, you need to talk with your doctor, go over the different issues and different options, and consider an intervention for your bone health to try to get you through that transition so you don't lose a lot of structure that you may not be able to gain in the future. That doesn't mean you have to stay on something for 15 years. It may just be three to five years then you can stop and your, you've, your body has gone through that transition and things slow down. So. Yeah, if I'm right on the borderline though, is the drug that you mentioned the other day that doesn't stay in the system any, yes, yes. Is that one that I should consider and offer, ask him about? So, um, 
I, I, I think that denosumab or the prolia, the only uh, hesitancy I have, it's a new drug. It's a new drug. So we don't know a lot of the, the long-term issues, but I think for short-term use, it seems to be incredibly well-tolerated and safe. There is a slightly higher infection rate, and so if you have immunocompromise, like you're on steroids or you have something wrong with your immune system where you, you don't mount any kind of normal immune response, that would not be the drug for you. In a normal, healthy person, and as far as I know, masto doesn't affect your risk of infection, or am I wrong? Um, you should do fine, but short-term, not, not long-term treatment. During the times when I'm having a masto flare, most of what I experience, uh, the worst part of it, is bone pain, feeling like sort of when you have the flu and every bone and, and joint in your body hurts. Is there something that, that, you, that we can do about that? I mean, when we, when we get it. The, the, re the reasons for bone, for bone pain and masto aren't that well worked out. Uh, some of the, the bone pain is actually muscle pain. Uh, there's certain reasons for bone pain and massive that we do know about. Uh, one would be a, a pathologic fracture or a compression fracture of the spine. Um, it's, been, it's been thought that expansion of the marrow cavity by mast cells and other uh, cells in mast to causes some of the pain. Um, and it's been uh, hypothesized that microfractures in the bone cause some of the pain. I don't know how much evidence there is for, for, for the microfracture, but that's one of the ideas. Um, th I mean, the best way to, to prevent your, your bone pain is to prevent your spells, your, your attacks. And the best way to do that is to quantify the, the mediators that you're excreting at the time of your spells so that they can be blocked by the appropriate antihistamine, anti 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 uh, prostaglandin inhibitors, what have you. So um, it's sort of a roundabout route to stop your bone pain, but we would, would want to stop your spells. And by doing that, you know, you wouldn't have the pains, hopefully. Um, did, have, you had, uh, have you had your mediators quantitated, your unmethyl histamine, prostaglandin, things like that? Uh, by the time I get to the end here, get all those things done. Okay, exactly right. I mean, at Mayo, I don't know if there's any other places doing this, but we, get, we give our patients a kit to have at home with a urine jug, a mail back mailback bottle that they pour an aliquot of that drug that they filled up uh, after they've weighed the jug and a blood tube. And when they have an attack, uh, the patients collect their own urine. Uh, they go into their doctor, their ER, their wherever, and get the blood tube drawn. And then they mail it back to us. They mail it to the, the sample, the blood tube, and then we can see what's going on at the time of their symptoms. I think that's, that's the only way we can find out what's happening at the time you're symptomatic because some people aren't big histamine producers. They're prostaglandin producers or they're both. And unless you block the right mediators, attacks are going to still keep happening. And like you say, when you're in the clinic, you're feeling okay. We measure your, your, your tests and, and the trip date is probably going to be up. But the other mediators may be fine. So it's, it's a bit of a puzzle. We have to work through that kind of a, a process. This is not totally to do with bones, but I am frequently on steroids, which I know can create bone loss and weight gain and those things that are going to contribute to bone loss. And right before I left, I got a result back on the quantity of insulin in my blood. Does mastocytosis have any effect on that, or is that the steroids that I'm taking? That um, I think they said my insulin was three times what it should be in my blood. So uh, steroids have many positive effects, and they're very potent anti-inflammatory. They suppress the immune system if, if you've got autoimmune disease, but they have a lot of negative effects. Um, one of the major negative effects is on bone. The other is on um, metabolism, including causing diabetes and insulin resistance. Um, as far as bone, the way steroids are uh, hurtful to bone is they suppress 
the, uh, the should I use this or not? Yes, okay, uh, the uh, steroids suppress the osteoblast, which is a cell that makes bone, gets very much suppressed by the steroids. So you, and then you have a little bit of stimulation of the osteoclast that eats away bone. So it's like a perfect storm because you're, you're not making new bone, but you're eating away bone. So, um, but if you need steroids to control the symptoms, then you need them. Most of my patients who are going to be on more, three months or more of steroids are on some bone protective agent, whether it be a bisphosphonate or something. Um, because they are at such risk for losing bone and fractures. Even with normal bone density, people can have fractures while on steroids. It, the bone quality gets very adversely affected. So are you on something for, on but are you on for anything I'm, for bone? I'm taking vitamin D, D. And a loading dose of, right. a loading dose of vitamin D and then calcium. Calcium, but nothing else for bone. So calcium and vitamin D are critical because steroids also cause calcium loss through the kidneys, and some people get kidney stones. And steroids also interfere with the metabolism of vitamin D, so there's often vitamin D deficiency. But that may not be enough just to take those, and you may want to consider um, being on or getting an intermittent dose of bisphosphonate, maybe intravenous or, or whatever. If you're premenopausal, your risk of fracture with steroids is not nearly as high as if you're postmenopausal because the estrogen protects you to some extent. But depending on your dose of steroids and your bone density, that may not be enough. So you have to get evaluated. Um, it sounds like you've got insulin resistance, which can be a sign of prediabetes. Uh, the key to that is to try to lower the dose of steroids, exercise, weight loss, avoidance of carbohydrates, which stress the pancreas, and hopefully avoid diabetes. There is a drug called metformin that are you familiar with? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay, good. So right now you've got very compensated insulin resistance. Do you have a family history of diabetes? You do. So there's a role of genetics and then a role of, you know, life, steroids, etc. So um, right now you're doing okay. Uh, metformin, by the way, can cause a lot of gastrointestinal side effects with diarrhea and abdominal pain, so just be aware of that if you do try that. <clears throat> but um, the best thing is to keep yourself monitored. Try to lower the dose of steroid exercise. Exercise makes your body's insulin work much better. And even modest weight loss of of, you know, less than 10% of body weight can, can totally reverse the insulin resistance, even sometimes in people on steroids. So it's tough, but it's, it, that's what you try to do. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. I, I would not take metformin if you're if if, if you've had um, like a glucose tolerance test and you you pass that and and don't have glucose intolerance. I would especially with masto. I wouldn't give you metformin. I think you're going to get a lot of side effects, but you need to be closely monitored. Thank you very much, Pat. Is there a negative? effect of taking calcium? So is there a negative effect of taking calcium? Yes, there can be. Do, do any of you take calcium? Do you experience any side effects from calcium? Uh, okay. So some people get constipation and other gastric distress. So there, there's those immediate side effects that can occur. 
The other thing that's come out recently about calcium in the last year or so are reports that taking calcium supplements, particularly without vitamin D, can increase your risk of myocardial infarction or heart attack and um, other vascular diseases, uh, vascular, uh, you know, stroke, etc. This is controversial, a lot of controversy, but what we have done based on these, often these are meta-analyses that take a lot of different studies already published and then and analyze them as one study and find these correlations, like people who took calcium ended up with 30% higher risk of heart attack. So the methods are, can be criticized. But I think a, a safe thing is to say if you don't overdose with calcium, you can probably avoid any risk, increased risk of, of kidney stones or cardiovascular disease. Some people are taking 2,000 milligrams of calcium or more. You try to get as much calcium as you can naturally through diet with dietary intake of, of yogurt, cheese, milk, green vegetables, tofu, and whatever you need to get to that 1,200 milligrams of calcium, you can then take with a supplement rather than taking all with a supplement. If your diet is good and you get dairy, you probably don't even need a supplement. No study has shown that calcium in the diet causes heart disease. The only studies that have shown this association, which is controversial, are studies in which calcium is given as a supplement, not as a dietary. Did you say in the beginning that calcium with vitamin D doesn't cause this? And all of the studies that showed this association with heart disease were excluding studies in which calcium and vitamin D were given together. Vitamin D seems to be a helpful thing for the heart, but they excluded that because they didn't want to confuse the issue. They just wanted to look at calcium. So probably no one takes just calcium without vitamin D. So it's, that's, but kidney stones can occur and if you have a history of kidney stones, you should, again, try to get calcium more through diet. Or if you take calcium, take it with your food so it binds to oxalate because many stones are calcium oxalate. And that way the calcium can take some of the oxalate out, out of the body through the stool. So does that answer your question? Yeah. I was recently told that carob has a lot of calcium in it, carob, 200% uh, more than milk. Um, this was on an island in the Mediterranean or Adriatic Sea, and this woman said nobody on the island had osteoporosis because they used carob powder on everything. And I haven't researched that. I was wondering if you knew about that. Mm -hmm. Carob, it's, uh, it's like a... Chocolate substitute. Sorry if it's a bit off topic, but I, I see that you have endocrinology background too. And um, I'm curious for some comments about the interrelationship between the hormonal system and masto. You know, you hear the anecdotal stories. Some of them are very cute about women who are pregnant feel better than they have ever. And maybe that's not true for everybody. I look at the body as, a, as an entire system, and I see, you know, how stress affects the endocrine system, probably through, what, corticosteroids and gluco, gluco, I can't say it, 
because I'm not a doc. But, yeah, and so um, one thing that I sat through the conference and didn't hear much about was the issue of the hormones and the endocrine system as it relates to um, the mast cell disorders, and wonder if you could give us a few comments about that. I'll take a stab at that. Um, most, most patients with, with MASTO don't have any underlying hormonal problem. Um, in the course of working up patients for MASTO, uh, it's often the case that we'll rule out other disorders that have similar symptoms, and some of those are endocrine symptoms, uh, hyperthyroidism, for example, um, um, pheochromocytoma, carcinoid. We rule out a lot of these other confounding disorders that are actually a lot more common than mastocytosis, which, as you know, is an orphan disease. It, and it's, it's, I mean, you see all these people here today, but it's a vanishingly rare disease in, in, the, in the real world. It's, it's, it's quite rare, and it's, it's the exception that a, that a doctor in practice for 30 years would, would see even one case of this. So to draw inferences from a very rare uh, disease is somewhat hazardous anyways, but when we look for other disorders, uh, we, we don't commonly find other hormonal problems. Now, there are exceptions. There are prior reports. Um, from Dr. Thea Haredi's research, he's tied in uh, the endocrine system, the, uh, the stress, uh, stress factor with, um, uh, with, with um, aggravation of, 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 um, of mast of symptoms. And it is, it is frequently the case that we'll hear uh, patients say that stress aggravates their symptoms. So there's, there's probably some tie-in um, uh, through stress. Um, it's, it's hard to quantify. Um, some, of the, some of the antihistamines, some of the drugs we use for their antihistamine effect, for example, doxifen, have an anti-anxiety effect as well as an antihistamine effect and uh, an antidepressant effect as well. And that seems to help, for whatever reason, a combination of the, the effects on the on the uh, MASTO patient, the antihistamine, the anti-anxiety, the, um, the antidepressant effect. So uh, there, is, there is probably something to this, but it's hard to tell you exactly because of the rarity of the disorder and the infrequency that we see uh, a frank um, endocrine problem going along with it. It's almost, it's almost reportable, aside from, say, the osteoporosis problem and perhaps some, some others. So, so I, I want to follow up on what he asked about pregnancy. So what happens to women who get pregnant with MASTO? Does their disease get better, worse? Yeah, I, Is there I, any effect? I, I can only recall one or two patients um, that I've ever followed that, that were pregnant when they, when they had MASTO. And... Um, Overall, what I can recall is that there was no particular problem with the pregnancy. The deliveries weren't particularly um, uh, hazardous. Uh, the babies were all delivered well, and there were no particular problems with the babies. Um, but my experience is, is fairly limited, even with the number that I see. I, I think there's only maybe one or two that I've seen uh, for their pregnancies. I was recently pregnant with mastocytosis and for the entire nine months I had zero symptoms. I didn't know that I had mastocytosis at the time but I'd had it for a year and so I stopped looking for what was wrong for me, wrong with me. Shortly after that when she was born I did the bone marrow and you know things had come back but when I was pregnant I had zero symptoms. Yesterday um, a couple of the speakers alluded to the idea that gastrochrome might be helpful in terms of preventing some bone destruction. The question I have is I do take gastrochrome and have for many years, uh, about 800 milligrams a day. Um, is increasing that dosage in any way helpful to uh, improving the bone loss situation? So I... I have no idea whether, and again, I'll ask Dr. Butterfield, whether um, the chromalin or gastrochrome, uh, which is a mast cell stabilizer, uh, helps bone. I think it should. If it, 
yeah, if it if it lowers uh, the the release of mediators and so on, I would think it would. But I'm not aware of any studies looking at that issue. Not to even mention dose response. Um, <clears throat> getting back to again the the pregnancy issue, you know, estrogen has anti-inflammatory effects. It it lowers cytokines like interleukin-6 and, and certain other inflammatory mediators. And it's not unusual when some women go into menopause, everything starts to hurt. Their joints hurt. Their, they get aches in their, their hands, their joints that they never had before. And so it doesn't surprise me to hear that during pregnancy, the masto may be better because perhaps the estrogen, that very high level of estrogen, is, is suppressing some of these mediators of inflammation and some of the, the you know, mast cell products. I don't know that, but it makes sense to me that, and this is another area that probably needs to be looked at. They, they do. Not really increase in symptoms, but a significant increase in the number of UP lesions, just spot spots during pregnancy, during preg during and and a while after pregnancy. Yeah, you did. Okay, I'm just curious about that. So, the, no, they didn't go. They've stayed, but nothing. You know, they just don't really do anything. They're just there, but they but they did definitely increase. And I was I've been wondering about that quite a bit too, because, and especially thinking of somebody, you know, like premenopausal, but going into it at some point soon, that's especially a concern for me, too. As I entered menopause, that's when all of my anaphylaxis and all of the masto symptoms came out. Me too. That's when everything happened. Right. Uh, I don't know exactly what to tell you. The, um, the, the symptoms are probably related both to the, uh, the number of mast cells you have, which, which could, have, you know, could have reached a critical tipping point at that particular moment in your life, if, particularly if they were slow growing or you didn't have a lot for many years and they just ramped up. Finally, they reached the point where they're going to give you some problems, more problems. And to the sort of the inherent uh, twitchiness of your cells, like for mast cell activation type problems, you know, a lot of people with mast cell activation, they don't have increased numbers of mast cells. The mast cells just, um, for whatever reason, they're, they're degranulating, they're releasing product. And um, so it may be that um, you, had, you just had a critical number reached, uh, perhaps with the hormonal changes, they reached a point where they were just going to be more uh, be more releasable and uh, that's that's why it, you know it's, it's, it's very tempting to say just because a happens before B that a caused B it, it could have happened anyways um, so, but it, it's hard to tell you for, for certain yeah. oh. I have uh, osteopenia and uh, my dentist expressed a little bit of concern about bone necrosis in the jaw if I took a biophosphate. Um, and can you explain that a little bit? And is why is it that the jaw is the first to um, be affected? So uh, you're referring to what's called ONJ or osteonecrosis of the jaw, and um, this, this is a rare complication of bisphosphonates that was started to be reported out of Columbia Presbyterian in 2003 when uh, a dental group started noticing uh, patients coming in, most of them cancer patients, getting chemotherapy and very high doses of intravenous bisphosphonates. And um, these were not generally osteoporosis patients. 
So they started reporting this death of the jawbone. It's necrosis means death and I osteo. Remind you that we're yep. about halfway through yep. our session, so if anybody so. would like to switch to another group or take advantage of another uh, opportunity to speak to different physicians, we yep. should think about moving yep. now. So um, osteonecrosis of the, of the jaw is actually death of the jawbone. And uh, what happens, it's usually after an invasive procedure, such as a dental extraction or an implant, and the bone does not heal. And when they looked, they found these patients had been receiving very high doses of bisphosphonates. The mechanism is not known. It's not understood, but it's, it's felt that um, th there may be uh, decreased uh, blood flow, uh, inability to resorb the bone. You know, when you get a dental implant or an extraction, a lot of healing has to occur, and part of the healing involves bone resorption and bone activity. So if you have a lot of bisphosphonate, present that might inhibit that bone activity and then it, the bone things cannot heal so but it's a dose effect and it doesn't occur in short term relatively short term exposure with with oral bisphosphonates there are maybe you know there are several hundred cases maybe a thousand in the world out of 25 million people who took, so you've got to put it in perspective. Um, the, if you have cancer and your multiple myeloma for in particular or metastatic breast cancer and you're getting very frequent doses of intravenous bisphosphonate, the risk can be as high as 10% to get this jaw necrosis. It's not trivial and it's terrible. For someone with osteopenia and well-controlled masto, if you have that, you could just be followed as long as you're doing well. You don't necessarily have to be treated if you're doing well. You could be followed. If you do take treatment, it should be for relatively short term, up to three to five years, then you stop and you go on a holiday. So you don't over accumulate too much of the drug in your bone. Yep, yep, and then you get monitored and maybe after two to four years, you might go back for a few years, a little touch up, and then you stop again. Kind of an intermittent therapy can work very well. You can get the benefits without all the negatives. I came here really to ask also about bone pain and how uh, we can stop it. But I, ha I was on, I've been um, I was diagnosed in 1989. I was on the uh, bio because I had I was 26. I had a uh, full blown osteoporosis, and I took the, that medication for more than 10 years. And what happened was I blamed it on like the Fizomax. I cracked my teeth and I was losing teeth. And then I went to get my um, implants, and they said they can't do it. Um, because of the amount of time that I was on it and then it was kind of a blessing because then I got off the medication and then I started with the uh, and I took two, I think it's too high dose of um, calcium with the vi vitamin D but I do not have osteoporosis anymore which is I think a good thing so from 26 to now and now I'm 48 I don't have it but like I think I mentioned to you on my PET scan I had model bones <clears throat> that sounds to me not like osteoporosis, but like masto in the bone marrow. Can you describe the radiologic findings? Right. Well, the, the, there's there's several uh, radiologic findings uh, of bone involvement in masto. There's there's osteoporosis, which is thinning of your bones. Um, and there's another finding called osteosclerosis um, in which the bone appears more dense. And in the osteosclerotic, the patients of mostly osteosclerosis, those areas of sclerosis have a much higher concentration of mast cells than the osteoporotic areas. So sclerosis 
is more severe mastoinvolvement of the bone. More of those patients will have bone problems, will need chemo, will have problems with their blood counts. Um, sometimes there's mixed porosis and sclerosis. And sometimes the presence of osteosclerosis, especially in the spine, and correct me if I'm wrong, it can interfere with the bone density, accurate bone density measurements because it falsely densifies the bone in the, in the spine. And sometimes other areas might be more preferable to check, maybe the wrist or the hip or something. Yeah. I've had it done by NIH, and they always check the same bones, and they made sure I was on the same machine, because I've been with them for, I mean, since I was first diagnosed, so like I've, I've had that. But my question, too, is what can we do for the bone pain? Because like even sitting is painful, standing is painful, moving around. Sometimes when I have uh, masto attacks, um, I ha it starts in the arms, and I, I have the pain from the wrist going up into here, and my skin starts turning bright red because, and it and it's extremely painful. That I mean, I cry. I mean, it's 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 horrible. Uh, we alluded to this a little bit before. One is to to stop your to prevent your attacks. If we can do that, then you won't be faced with the downstream problems with the release of the mast cell mediators, causing all the the negative effects on your bone. There's been a couple of, of medicines that have been tried for, for bone pain and mass. So one is uh, calcium and vitamin D. Um, the uh, bisphosphonates have helped some patients. The combination of a bisphosphonate uh, and interferon alpha uh, has been... You, you're taking it? No, but it doesn't okay. stop the bone. How much do you take? I take uh, 5 million uh, three times a week. Okay, R a reasonable dose. Mm -hmm. um, and the other uh, reported... Uh, there's been one or two other drugs that have been reportedly helpful, although not in large series. One's been catodafin, which um, you can get from Canada. It's not, uh, it's not expensive and it's not hard to take. It's a pill. And, and there's, a, there's an older report of, of uh, cimetidine, which is an H2 receptor blocker. Cimetidine. Cimetidine. Um, not much on it. Uh, one or two reports. Uh, very old, very old reports. Um, there's... Uh, that is aside from using di direct painkillers, uh, but this more targeted treatment. Because right. sometimes to sleep, you know, you take. Um, anybody else? in patients without masto has been associated with reduction of back pain. Um, it's the anabolic, the bone building treatment that we're not sure is safe in masto. But that is associated with reduction in bone pain. But I, I think it is... I have less bone pain with it. Now, I, I take terapeptide uh, for Teo and have since April. Um, I think that the pain that I was experiencing in the long bones of my leg, I think are somewhat improved with the Forteo. My back, that's much more complicated. <laughs> so, it's what vitamin so. D levels do you work toward then? If people have bone pain, how far are you willing to push? Yeah. Um, in terms of vitamin D and pain, um, it, there's a, there is a correlation. With, and if you have low vitamin D, you can have bone pain from something called osteomalacia, which is uh, literally soft bones, unmineralized bone. People um, are weak in their legs. They, they, are, they, they hurt, especially in their lower extremities. They can have fractures. Um, so vitamin D, I like the level between 30 to 60. Uh, the Institute of Medicine said you only need a level of 20 to be sufficient, but we don't agree with that. So you don't want too much vitamin D because, again, you could risk kidney stones and perhaps a vascular calcification. But I think a level between 30 to 60, and maybe if you have masto on the higher end, of, of that range should be safe and, and would help any bone pain from low vitamin D. They've also shown interesting that patients in a rheumatology clinic for fibromyalgia 
were found to have low vitamin D levels that, and their pain syndrome often got better when their vitamin D was increased above 30. So their so-called fibromyalgia improved. Um, so I do think vitamin D, low vitamin D, can be a factor causing pain in, in all patients, but also in, in Masto. Deficiency. There's an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency in this country, especially in Boston. <laughs> I, I apologize if you've already asked or answered this, but how I'm, I'm 52 years old, okay? My bones were in the upper 90 percentile until about three years ago, bone density began to plummet. Um, I, my vitamin D level was seven. I live in Alaska, seven. Seven. It barely registered, okay? It's up around 35 to 40 right now. Um, how often should I be having a bone density? You know, my doctor at home is thinking every two to three years. But I'm thinking if there's that much dynamic activity, it ought to be more often. Yeah. Or am I being hysterical about this? No, no, you're not being hysterical. I, I think that, uh, you know, we... We recommend if you're in a dynamic situation, which you are, where you've been losing bone, are you on treatment now other than vitamin D or, or uh, uh, calcium? Yeah. So they found, they found a reversible cause of your, of your bone loss, including, and of course, menopause. Um, I would check it yearly. And once you stabilize, you could go to every two to three years. But during this transition, I think an annual bone density is reasonable because you want to make sure you've stopped losing bone, stabilized, hopefully filled in some of those holes and improved the bone density. Yeah, calcium, vitamin D, exercise, weight-bearing exercise. W hormone therapy is an interesting uh, thing to talk about. You know, we used to recommend it all the time to postmenopausal women, not myself, but we as the medical community. And then after the Women's Health Study came out in 2002, it's become much less popular because of the risk of breast cancer and cardiovascular disease. However, it is still recommended for women who have significant menopausal symptoms and is felt to be relatively safe, for again, for short-term use. If you don't have a lot of hot flashes and night sweats, other symptoms like mood swing, it's probably not a good choice. Um, when I prescribe hormone therapy, it, 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 it is good for bone. It it's lowers those inflammatory cytokines and stops the osteoclastic bone resorption. But I often use the patch, an estrogen patch, which is transdermal, doesn't get through the liver, doesn't go through the what's called the portal circulation, and I think has um, fewer side effects and is safer. But only for short-term use, one, two, three years. So. A lot of us take things like clonidine as part of the masto drugs, and that interferes with calcium. What's the best way then to get what we need? So the qu you're on renitidine. You're on H2 blockers. Um, I am not aware of H2 blockers being really negative for bone. The proton pump inhibitors, the, the more potent acid blockers, have been associated with higher risk of fractures, but there's a lot of conflict in those studies. When they've looked at patients given a PPI, a proton pump in inhibitor, and measured the actual calcium absorption, it's actually been minimally affected. Whether there's any direct effect of like proton pump inhibitors on bone cells, I'm not aware of. So I tell patients, if you're going to take calcium, your best bet is get it through diet, number one. Number two, 
take calcium citrate, which does not depend on acid to get absorbed. So if you're on an anti-acid, whether an H2 blocker or a, or a PPI, you will still absorb calcium citrate. Calcium carbonate requires um, acid environment for optimal absorption. So take citrate and you don't have to worry whether you're on an acid blocker at all. But, the, but it's probably a minimal effect, if any. Good point. Yes. So there is there is no question that in male osteoporosis, um, uh, we look for low testosterone. What is a low testosterone in men is of controversy because uh, some men have low free testosterones. Those t assays are terrible. So what we do in our clinic is we measure total testosterone in something called a sex hormone binding globulin, and we correct it. Many men have been told they have low testosterone when they really don't. If someone really does have a low testosterone, that is clearly associated with, with loss of bone density and higher risk of falls and fractures in men. Um, as well as decreased libido, erectile dysfunction, anemia, and um, decreased muscle strength, uh, increased fat distribution around the middle, et cetera. However, treating men with testosterone, unless they're really clearly deficient, has some issues. And there's been a risk of increased cardiovascular events in men with mildly low testosterone given testosterone therapy. In fact, a study was recently stopped because the men, these were older men getting testosterone hit more heart attacks. But if you are clearly deficient and your testosterone is low and you have osteoporosis, testosterone will help build the, uh, help its anabolic and Men with low testosterone also have low estrogen. And estrogen is as important for the male skeleton as it is for the female skeleton. So when you give a man testosterone, interestingly, you're also, he converts some of that to estrogen. And both of them help his bones and the testosterone also helps muscle strength. So it should be given to men who are truly low with osteoporosis. It's a great question. Provided they don't have contraindications such as prostate cancer, sleep apnea, uh, very high hematocrit, you can get a stroke. So, you know, you've got to do an evaluation. You've got to, you've got to watch the PSA, all of that. But by the time we, um, we get referred, uh, ma males referred with, uh, with osteoporosis, they've gone through a full endocrinology evaluation that's come up uh, empty-handed. And uh, we'll, we're seeing mainly uh, men with with mass, mass cell disease. Um, the pain is, is somewhat hard to control in a lot of, a lot of these men because they've, they've had significant uh, compression fracture problems. Uh, they, um, they may be on, um, on narcotics uh, for the pain. Um, and um, despite everything, um, they've con continued to get worse and worse. Uh, that's about the time we see them. Uh, we diagnose their mast cell disease and then we go from there uh, despite everything else, um, it's often the case that we have to treat them with, with interferon alpha to stop the march of their mast cell disease because it can be pretty significant by the time we see them, uh, along with giving them a, um, a bisphosphonate. And even the combination is sometimes slow to have any effect, uh, effect on them. So, um, I have what I hope is not too basic of a question, but I have mast cell activation disorder 
I've had fibromyalgia for years. It's been in remission except for when my mast cell is going crazy. Um, and my joints, I can't tell if it's your bone pain or joint pain or neuromuscular pain, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm wondering how you tell the difference. And then the other question is, is really basic but important is, what type of bone density testing do you recommend? Is it the same for anybody, or is it different if you have mast cell? And what type of vitamin D testing do you recommend? Uh, talk first about the vitamin D testing. The vitamin D test that we do is the 25-hydroxy vitamin D. That is actually not the active vitamin D. The active vitamin D is made in your kidneys. It's called 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. But that is not a good level to measure because it fluctuates greatly. The 25-hydroxy D is the storage form of vitamin D that really reflects what your body has stored. So that's what you want. Um, that was, that's the easy one to answer. Um, the second question you asked was about bone density. Uh, the, the gold standard for bone density is the DEXA, the Dual Energy X-ray Absorptiometry. It looks at your lower spine, your hip, and in some cases it can look at your distal radius, your wrist. If you have, if you're a man or older woman, you probably have significant... You probably have um, significant degenerative disc disease. This is very, very common in men, which often renders your bone density quite inaccurate at the spine because it looks like you have a lot of bone, but it's really all in the joints of the spine. It's arthritis and disc deterioration. So it, particularly in my male patients, we always get the hips and the wrist because we want to have two different sites to look at. The spine is often falsely elevated like a high bone density, and it's not really telling you about the strength of the bones. If you have compression fractures of your spine, that too will look like a high bone density because the density is compressed into a smaller area. So that's another false reading. So typically we get one hip, the lower spine, and in many cases, the wrist. Um, those are the key predictive areas. As far as separating out pain, is it muscular? Is it joint? Is it bone? Bone pain itself is pretty unusual unless you fractured or you've got something infiltrating your bone marrow, whether it be mast cells, cancer, um, hemochromatose, you know, something else going on. Actual bone pain is pretty rare. Osteomalacia from vitamin D deficiency can cause actual bone pain because the bone is not mineralized well. Um, hyperparathyroidism can lead to bone pain fibrosis, actual scar tissue in the bone, leading to sclerotic bone. Um, but often when it's pain, it's often joint or muscle rather than bone pain. And I, ref I often refer my patients to a rheumatologist or a rehab doctor to help work with their joints and their muscles to improve that. For, for mastil, it's mainly the, the axial skeleton the spine, hips, ribs, maybe proximal uh, ends of the long bones, but not the little, not the little bones, not the fingers, not the toes, not, you know, it, this okay, isn't this everybody. isn't mass though. If you got pain in your fingers and wrists, generally not. The conference will close now. I have 